Welcome to this special episode of Frequency Matters. I'm Gary LaRue of Microwave Journal, here with Dave Slack, the Director of Engineering at Times Microwave Systems. Dave, welcome. Thanks, Gary. Good morning. Well, it's always fun to talk with you because I learn so much and the topics are so interesting. Today, we're going to talk about quantum computing. And given my past experience with the topic, I hope you will go slow. So to start, what is quantum computing? So quantum computing has been in development for a couple of decades now, but it's really starting to it's really starting to heat up um, for several reasons. And I compare it to classical computing, right? Well, classical computing we're all familiar with. We use ones and zeros and binary data. Quantum computing works using the quantum properties of atomic and subatomic matter, right? It uses those very strange quantum properties. And it's it's pretty interesting technology. I tend to look at new technologies like this in a historical context, because I find oftentimes you can look at what has happened and play that forward and get a pretty good understanding of how things are going to play out in the upcoming years. So if you look back at the development of classic computing, right, in 1951, the U.S. Census Bureau took delivery of, of a machine called Univac. Mm. Right, this Univac was room sized. It was, was sixty thousand pounds, five thousand vacuum tubes, and it could it could perform calculations at a massive one thousand calculations per second. So mm. it processed at a kilohertz. Right. Um, today we have today we have you know megahertz, you know hundreds of megahertz computing power in our pockets that we're just carrying around with us. So quite a quite a gap has been covered in that in that period so from from 1951 with the vacuum tubes in the late 50s um, transistors were introduced in the 60s and 70s those transistors were integrated into integrated circuits 1980s microprocessors came along and computers computers got more and more powerful and they got smaller and smaller and smaller 1965 a gentleman named gordon moore um, Put out Moore's law that the, mm-hmm. the transistor density of of chips would double every year, and that has that has been true from 1965 until about 2010. 2010 Moore's law started to trail off a little bit, meaning that the technology behind classical computing is starting to reach its the the limits of physics and the limits of economics. So to get the computing power that you know, many industries need is going to be increasingly less possible with with classic computing. So classical computing, as we as we mentioned earlier, uses a very discrete ones and zeros, no ambiguity. It's either or nowhere, nowhere in the middle. It's very predictable. It's very uh, reproducible. Quantum physics uses the properties of of quantum of quantum mechanics, which is the mechanics of, of of matter at very, very microscopic scales. Um, the basic element for computations in, is called a, a quantum bit or a qubit. And a qubit can be in, it can be a one and, or a zero, but, t- but it's actually should be thought of as a one and a zero because it could be both, mm. right? Which is, kind of, which is kind of weird when you think about it. And quantum, quantum mechanics also uses the principle of, of entanglement where one qubit can be in a state and it will be coupled with another qubit and the, and the states of the, their states will kind of mimic each other without any physical connection, which is like super weird. So when I try to get my head around, how can a, how can a bit of data be a one and a zero, right? That's, that's really hard for me to grasp. So I think of it being a microwave guy, I think of it in terms of noise. Right, I, I think about that spectrum analyzer with no inputs, and you you set your filters up, and you get a noise floor down 130, 140 dB dBm, and you see the randomness. You just see random noise, and yeah. you could park a marker at any frequency you want to, and you're going to get this range of noise values. You know, they're they're going to be it's going to be all over the place. 
So you cannot say that if I put a marker at five gigahertz, I am going to measure power X. It's True. just not that it's not that deterministic like you would expect in a classical computing world being a one or a zero. Right? What you're going to see is you're going to see a range of a range of numbers. And if you if you capture those numbers over time, that you can describe them statistically. You have you will have X probability of measuring Y value every time you sample it. It's about the best you can do. And and that's the way I th I think of of a quantum bit a qubit being a one and a zero. If you're if you're controlling it and it should be in the one state, you know, statistically it's gonna tend to be in the one state, but but it could be in, in a zero or anywhere in between. It, it's it's only what is it when I measure it is what matters. So quantum computing takes advantage of 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 both of those properties, the 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 superposition properties of the one and a zero and the entanglement properties. So, so um, the entanglement kind of gives you true like parallel processing. So where, whereas classical computing power increases linearly as a function of computing power, as uh, the number of transistors, number of bits, um, quantum computing increases exponentially with the number of qubits. So they can be they can become like massively more powerful with every time you add on another another bit. They have they have the ability to be super super powerful with a fraction of the of the energy usage. So I'm with you so far. That makes sense. I like your analogy of the kind of the noise floor on a spectrum analyzer to try to understand the probabilistic nature. So if we think about uh, more practical terms, uh, you talked about the power of uh, quantum computing, but what would a, co a quantum computer be able to do? So first of all, what they will not do is replace classical computing. We're always gonna have that. There's always going to be, that is always going to be the best tool for many, many calculations. Um, what quantum computing will do is it allows, it uses different bits, it uses different algorithms, and it works totally differently. And what it will allow you to do is take problems that have a massive number of inputs and, and where these inputs are not always discreetly defined, they're, they're more statistical inputs. And it, will, it allows you to process problems like that because that's the way the machine thinks and works, if you will. Um, the, um, the 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 use cases that are seen for this is is um, anything where anything where a large number of complex numbers are involved, like uh, like cybersecurity, right? Security, mm -hmm. uh, banking, security, financial and economic modeling. <clears throat> modeling. I mean, if you try to get two economists to agree on what the economy is going to do, right? The, their models are limited in what they can do. So the, uh, uh, a quantum computer is, is really geared towards that kind of a complex problem with thousands and thousands of inputs into it. Um, predicting the weather. You can also never get two, two weathermen to agree on what the weather is going to do. It's super complicated modeling. Right. Climate change, right? All these, all these super complex models is where I think um, quantum computing has a fit. I think artificial intelligence um, is just going to explode when it has access to this tool. And the other, the, the other thing is, um, you know, aerodynamic and thermodynamic modeling, especially with um, hypersonic weapons, because mm. that, that modeling, that those, the thermodynamics and the aerodynamics at, at those speeds and velocities aren't well known. So today they're doing a lot of physical testing to kind of understand that. They run models that take weeks to complete. Um, having a quantum computer to run those models would be way less physical testing, and they could run more more models, you know, much more quickly. Be super super valuable. Interesting. So that makes sense. Uh, a lot of power involved there, particularly with very complex problems. Now we hear that there's a connection between quantum computing and microwave engineering. How is microwave engineering involved in quantum computing? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the question for, for this audience, for sure. I'm sure. We're, so how do we play in this, right? So 
so the qubits, you can think of the qubits as a, as a microwave resonator, like an LC tank or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, you can drive these qubits from a zero state uh, um, to a one state, to one energy level, zero or one, um, by driving it with a microwave signal. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a resonant and you drive it with a signal at that frequency of resonance and you're going to change the energy level within that resonator. Um, under this, under this driven condition, the, the probabilities of being a one or a zero vary sinusoidally with time and it could be controlled to much the way other signals can be controlled. It's, it's important to know that like other signals, the qubits have a magnitude and a phase relationship. They're, comp they're complex signals. So it's, it's, you know, it's very, very familiar to, to the microwave community, these, these concepts. Um, one of the limiting factors in quantum computing is when you have this, when you have this resonator under this driven condition and it's kind of predictable and controlled, that is only able to be maintained for a certain period of time because with any resonator, there's losses and there's things right. that affect it that cause it to lose, to lose energy and to stop resonating. Um, and that's the limiters here. That is called decorrelation of the qubit, right? When, mm. when these things are become decorrelated, they're no longer predictable. They're no longer controlled. And that's analogous to bit errors in data. So you have computational issues. So the correlation and the control of the qubits is one of the one of the real driving issues behind the um, the technology development. And what it really boils down to is um, the noise. The noise comes from thermal noise. It comes yeah. from magnetic noise, and it can come from mechanical noise, vibrations, things like that. So, so microwave hardware that can feed these resonators and and minimize these contaminations in fact one of the one of the prime limitations is super low noise um driving signals for these qubits especially low phase noise so um, a lot of work going on to like ultra ultra low phase noise oscillators and things like that so the way it to have a computer, you need more than one bit. So you have two bits or more multiple bits. So when you have, when you have two of these bits, you, you can, they can be coupled together and they can be controlled by this driving signal, which can be, which is at a microwave frequency and it can be amplitude and phase modulated to give it certain properties. Both qubits can be modulated separately. And then using the wave properties of the two, you can, you can get, you can get it to perform in certain ways. And they, they, the wave properties actually interfere, and it's um, it's um, very analogous to interferometry that you know antenna, mm -hmm. antenna and radar people do, and it's, and and I I I think of it again in terms of that classic high school demonstration of the two slits and the laser beam, and you get the interferometry pattern, which are kind right. of you get areas where the the two the two wave patterns can um, interfere constructively, and then others where the interfere destructively so you get kind of high density probabilities and low density probabilities you get essentially the ones and zeros uh, and and you can and those can be controlled all of the all of the hardware that's used to control these these qubits and this coupling all introduce these noises these these are uh, the thermal the the magnetic the the vibrational noise so the aside from the low noise sources of these driving signals and precise modulation schemes it's it's hardware that minimizes that that contamination is where the is where i think a lot of where the microwave community can support and i think one of the requirements is it uh, to maintain low noise is to have very low temperatures is that correct yeah absolutely so so the resonators i mean we all know you know, resonator, the lump constant model is a, an inductor in parallel with a capacitor, right? And if you have that, you have this, you have this perpetual motion machine. It just, the, the, the magnetic flux collapses, drives the capacitor, which then charges and then discharges and, and repeat. Um, that would go on forever on paper. But mm -hmm. in reality, there's losses. There's resist, resistive losses. So you get kind of a damped sine wave unless you feed back some of that energy with this driving signal. So being at, being at 
um, cryogenic temperatures, you know, below, you know, below four millikelvin, which is really mm. close to absolute zero, which also astounds me that we can, things can get that cold. But <laughs> yeah. um, you, you minimize the resistive losses. It's virtually zero. So you don't have those losses. The noise floor is less. So your thermal noise your, is less. So the, the quantum computing actually wants to happen in, in a really hard vacuum. Uh, at super cold temperatures and totally shielded from like the earth's magnetic field. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very, very, you know, pristine place that these com computations want to take place. And so you've convinced me that uh, there's a lot of potential here. What's the actual state of the technology and capability today? I know there's a lot of research going on, but uh, kind of where are we? So the way, the way I see it, we are in the period before Univac was delivered to mm. its customer. We're, we don't quite have that Univac machine, that big room-sized monster, right? The first, the first commercial quantum computers are going to be quite analogous to that. And I think over time, they're going to do what classic computers have done. They're going to get smaller and faster and more, more accurate very, very quickly. And I think... You know, in the in over the decades that has spanned between then and now, I think that I think that development time frame is going to be a fraction of what it was. So I think the next mm -hmm. the next five years are going to be astounding. Next year is going to be a big year, um, and the next ten years is just going to be amazing at, at where the development is. Um, Google is spending like billions and billions of dollars on this and they have recently just proclaimed supremacy they've proclaimed there's a there's a computer problem that google's quantum computer has solved in 200 seconds mm -hmm. that they claim that ibm's summit machine would take 10,000 years to solve wow. which is an astounding claim ibm of course disputes this ibm says that no it would take our summit computer two and a half days to solve this problem so by by IBM's own numbers, it's taken a two and a half day solution can now be done in 200 seconds, which is a thousand to one improvement. And this is on that pre, this is on that lab level computer. So um, if, if you, we can get a thousand time improvement of our quantum univac, um, the next the next five or ten years, I mean only only the imagination is mm. is, is our limits. I think it's. It's going to be um, it's going to be a a really interesting ride, and I'm really looking forward to see it unfold. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, that is fascinating. Thank you, Dave, for sharing your insight on the topic, and uh, you made it uh, very understandable. So I appreciate that. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And to our viewers, please join us for future episodes of Frequency Matters. You can find these conversations in video format, or we also make them available as podcasts. Thanks for watching or listening.